and I'll pass it over to Abigail for now to introduce our awesome guests. Fantastic, sir. Making sure I'm not muted. Um, I am um, I'm super excited to have Matt Myers with us. Um, he is somebody that I personally have been really uh, inspired and educated by. Um, I'm actually sorry, I thought I had the bio pulled up, but I had the wrong link pulled up. Um, so just to give a very summarized um, by uh, introduction for, for Matt, uh, Dr. Matthew Meyer is a sustainable healthcare researcher and advocate. Uh, he is a steering committee meeting of uh, Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action and co-chair of the UVA uh, Healthcare Sustainability Committee. And he is focused on uh, reducing unnecessary waste of sterile surgical items in the operating room and has created intellectual property in this field. He works clinically as an anesthesiologist and intensivist and is an associate professor of anesthesiology at the University of Virginia. And I guess I'll just editorialize and say that he's uh, really an amazing writer and thinking or thinker in this space. And the way in which he writes, I think, makes space for clinicians to understand healthcare sustainability and non-clinicians to also understand the importance of healthcare sustainability. So he's always on my to, to read list. Um, thank you for joining us, Matt. Thank you very much um, for that very generous introduction. And um, and I'm outdoors right now because indoors is my children getting clean. So it was not the right environment for <laughs> for for anything productive in this fashion, productive in other ways. So um, so I, I'm really excited to talk to you because healthcare sustainability is as my wife puts it, my hobby. Um, and I like talking to other people who think similarly about this. I am going to just give sort of a very quick tour de force on sort of my very like current look in terms of where healthcare is. I've got some slides. I always struggle with teams. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to share. Apparently, I've got to go to security and privacy in order to do this. Let me just take a second. Matthew, you can feel free to also uh, email it to us, uh, and we can also share it on our end if it's complex. Uh, it's not. It's not. This is just I. UVA is constantly upgrading its security, and just this evening it made it so. Oh God. Um, it wants me to quit Microsoft Teams so it can record and add the update. Um, are you able to see? Okay. Let's see. I think I'm going to be able to get there just around it. Okay. You able to see anything from my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. So this is a really quick overview and I'm actually more interested in the conversation that we're going to have at the end, but I just want to frame some thoughts that I think are particularly useful when you're trying to promote and think through healthcare sustainability. So um, again, this is like I'm in the I, I'm in the process of trying to write about a lot of this and this is a sample of what we can get into, but healthcare, health system sustainability, regulations and opportunities. So I always start whenever I talk about healthcare, I like to point out how big the health sector is in the US. So the healthcare sector in the US is about 18% of US GDP, which translates into about $5 trillion or uh, about 5% of the global US econ uh, global world economy. So it's just something to really think about is that healthcare is enormous. US healthcare is enormous. There is so much money inside of this. Like the amount we spend on healthcare is like, you know, the entire continent of South America, their GDP would fit into our healthcare expenditures. Like we're just, it, it's crazy how much money we spend on it, but it's also really powerful. The other issue that I have to blend whenever I talk about healthcare is the fact that we generate a lot of waste and pollution and that the waste and the pollution that we generate ends up harming the very mission that healthcare is dedicated to. And so all organizations in the health sector are de facto mission-driven organizations whose goal should be, and probably is written somewhere on their website, to reduce, to improve the health of people. And the only way that we can really reduce, um, it's, I should say, it's very difficult to improve the health of people if you're harming the environment in which those people live in. And so it's really easy to make that connection uh, 
in a way, which is that health and environmental health, like patient health and environmental health go hand in hand. And I know you guys heard from Amy Collins and Sam Adu before that, so I don't want to say anything more than just to really frame how much pollution, specifically carbon emissions, come out of the healthcare setting. And I always find framing these big numbers is helpful because otherwise they're just abs absolutely astronomical numbers and they don't really mean much. But in the U.S. healthcare sector, the 8.5 of U.S. healthcare, uh, U.S national emissions are coming from the healthcare sector. So 8.5%. To put that in perspective, it's 553 megatons, which is in my mind sort of a meaningless number. That's the amount of emissions that the entire country of Indonesia makes. And Indonesia has about 300 million people. So 300 million people live and have healthcare and exist in a country that's creating the same amount of emissions as our healthcare sector. So we are really, again, creating an oversized amount of emissions. You all have seen this and probably know this data fairly well at this point. The healthcare emissions that are in the U.S. are coming from three scopes. When we're talking about making healthcare more sustainable, we are talking about all three scopes. Scope one is the emissions that are actually coming from the plant. So you're, I mean, at University of Virginia, we have a coal-fired power plant uh, to generate the steam. Um, so it's something like that. The, the backup generators are on fossil fuels. Scope two is what's coming from the grid, so electricity. But the vast majority, this study shows a little over 80%. Other studies show somewhere around two thirds of a health system are scope three emissions, meaning everything else that goes into healthcare. And that's part of what makes this so complicated, but also makes it so powerful. The entire healthcare sector is really driven through health systems these days. And so if you can grab a health system and say you are going to start making some sustainability priorities and really sort of ask your vendors to meet these sustainability parameters, that's where the power starts to come. It's not necessarily in, in what you can do immediately in your health system. That's very important. But it's it's specifically how you can take the values that you're allowing your health system to adopt and pushing them out towards the other parts of the sector. A lot of the multinational corporations that are involved in healthcare are already very sensitive to these issues because they're operating in markets outside of the US, specifically the EU, which is a little more forward thinking to a lot more forward thinking when it comes to, to sustainability. So this is where this is the field that we're operating on you all know this but again just to reinforce the fact that 2009 climate change was identified as the biggest global health threat of the 21st century 2015 it was reiterated by the world health organization so this is this is the power that we have when we're talking about taking the moral high ground in this argument it, can you imagine going to a health system that wasn't focused on treating cancer you could not but here we are talking about uh, a concept that has been identified by various really respected organizations as being the greatest public health threat. And there's some health systems that still have their head in the sand about this. So this is really powerful data and dates to take with you. The problem is, is that the health system is so large, there's so much money inside of it, there's so much waste, it's a bloated system, and no one's been doing anything about this that people are actually starting to capitalize upon it. And when I say starting to, I don't mean starting to. I mean, they have been for at least a generation. I take this this clip um, from, it's from UCSF's startup incubator of sorts. And the point that I want to say is right on the, is right on the red at the top. So one of the slides in here says, if your solution doesn't have a disposable, try to re-engineer it so it does. The concept behind that is that if you have a disposable, you get recurring revenue. Recurring revenue is uh, catnip to investors. They want something that they don't have to sell just once. They want something that they can sell multiple times. And so this was actually encouraged inside of um, investor philosophy. It's, if you will, it's, it's sometimes called the razor razor blade um, model. So you buy a razor blade for a fraction of the cost and you buy those little disposables for the rest of your life and the disposables cost an outsized amount of money. And so that generates recurring revenue for Gillette. 
that's the concept behind the razor razor blade, and this has been espoused throughout healthcare. When you combine the fact that recurring revenue is very valuable with this recent push towards, um, you know, really a focus on sterility in places where sterility may or may not have previously existed, and I think about like linens, which never were ster sterile but are now somehow disposable, the easiest way for organizations to prove sterility is to just buy something new and let the factory deal with the certification. And the easiest way for a company to make money is to sell you something over and over again. So those two concepts have married together to create a real culture of disposables in the healthcare system. So I will say some good news is that I have to reach back into the internet archive these days to get this slide because in this slide deck, which is still available online, they no longer have this particular slide. So there is progress even in this presentation when it's given. Currently, this slide doesn't exist, but it did exist, and the ethos still exists throughout the healthcare system. This is a study that I think was just grossly undersighted. It was written by Jody Sherman, who is you know, uh, one of the leading lights in health, sustainable healthcare, anesthesiologist out of Yale, Matthew Eckelman, an engineer who does a lot of sustainable life cycle analyses out of Northeastern. And what they wrote was that the emissions, the emissions associated with healthcare sector are responsible for between 50 and 100,000 deaths each year. I don't know if I have my side. I do have my side. So again, putting this in perspective, because I want to give you rationale for why this is so important and data that you can take and you know make your administrators really pause that makes it the seventh leading cause of death so healthcare industry related pollution deaths are the seventh leading cause of death when you factor it in heart disease cancer trauma and a whole host of other diseases uh, and that that should be staggering because again why is the production of healthcare resulting in so much harm to human health? And then finally, just to complete this beautiful slide, in 2021, there was an emphasis, and again, this is in the setting of COVID. So a global pandemic was occurring when 200 and more, about 230 journals all together, including the New England Journal, the BMJ, and the Lancet, said the greatest threat to global public health is the continued failure of world leaders to keep the global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees and to restore nature. That is a clause all into its own that's worthy of an entire con discussion and much writing that I'm working on myself. But we're going to focus on the climate change because I think that's where we've got the most traction. People are paying the most attention right now. So this editorial really it, it galvanized a lot of support. And that support has occurred in a number of large organizations. Some of the organizations that I think the support was most readily apparent in was the National Academy of Medicine uh, created a climate collaborative out of, and it's led by a number of people who are very high up in organizations. It's everybody from Jonathan Perlin of the Joint Commission to former heads. I want to say it's Cardinal, which is one of the big healthcare disposable companies to uh, Walter Zhao, I believe is his name, who's the head of National Academy of Medicine, and about 10 to 15 other people who are on this board. A lot of heavy hitters, people from Medicare, Medicaid, that are really interested in trying to understand how to decarbonize healthcare. The issue with these committees is that everything is voluntary at this point. And and that's really a big problem. So we we've really we've got a movement. We've got a reason for a movement. We've got evidence on our side. We've got the moral high ground. We just don't really have a lot of regulations. So what I'm showing you here is way too busy of a slide, and I apologize for that. I don't like busy slides myself, but I wanted to put these numbers up here. So if you if you take a picture of it, you have it for yourself. This is like a thousand page document that it's an excerpt from, but it was published about a year ago now, and it was a survey that. CMS, which is the largest re regulatory body in the US and one which all health systems have to pay attention to the regulations. One fraction of this, decent amount of it, a couple you know, dozen pages or so, was focused on decarbonizing healthcare and sustainable healthcare. And so they interviewed a number of stakeholders and the comments are still available online. I can get you the link if you're interested in. But what they did was they tried to figure out, you know, what if we started to dip our toe in decarbonization? What does that mean? And so 
the top line that's in red is the part that I think we should all take with us. So Commons almost uniformly embraced the importance of setting goals for reduced emissions and increased climate resilience. That's buried in this document, but that's a very powerful statement. So there wasn't, there wasn't anyone who really said no to this. The requests were, were more timely data to understand threats and health impacts, financing, of course, money, operational and clinical improvements, so assistance with that, standardizing measures, so how do you monitor this, emergency preparedness, like guess what? We realize that there's more fires, there's more storms. How do we deal with this? They wanted to make sure that it wasn't just focused on hospitals, which is where a lot of sustainable healthcare is focused so far. And then here's really where I find a lot of the money is engaging supply chain stakeholders because health systems alone cannot eliminate carbon dioxide emissions and pollution from the healthcare system. But once you start to push out into the scope three emissions to your vendors, that's where the real money is. So this was as um, Sarah and I have lamented and others on this call have lamented. This was one of the most beautiful moments which lasted not that long, which is when the Joint Commission put out a draft standard encouraging, or actually, I mean, it was at this point expected to be mandating that anyone who got Joint Commission accreditation and Joint Commission accreditation is necessary in order to receive Medicare, Medicaid funding. So that's, that's a big point is that Joint Commission does not make regulations. They make standards which ensure the health system is in line with other regulations from other people. About 70% of their standards come straight from places like CMS, and then they do make up some other standards. And so this would be a standard that was in line with the proposals that Medic CMS has proposed in the document I just showed, and in line with where current thinking is. And I'll just read you the top line, which was very beautifully and elegantly, the hospital decreases greenhouse gas emissions and waste. Now, was the standard perfect? Absolutely not. But it really did the bare minimum. It, it did the basics. So it designated leadership to oversee this effort. It told you to take pick three projects, and those were in places that really need sustainable healthcare and sustainable thought. So energy use, purchased energy, so electricity working on your grid, anesthetic gas use, which can be up to three or five percent of an entire health system's footprint. Uh, pressured meter dose inhaler use, another one that's outsized, so just albuterol, things like that. There's a propellant in there that's a terrible greenhouse gas. Fleet vehicles, so the cars, the ambulances, the trucks, and then solid waste disposable landfills. And then you, what you had to do is you had to create a plan to monitor that and a plan to reduce it. And then you had to evaluate it and make that plan better. Not perfect, but a really good framework for starting. Problem was, that it became extra credit in about three weeks. They decided to walk it back. And part of the reason why they walked that back is that they they heard from senior executives, and I quote from one of the senior executives at the Joint Commission, they were told to stay in their lane. And while there was very good excitement from clinicians and specifically younger clinicians uh, were called out uh, by uh, Dr. Jonathan Perlin, the decision was made that they could not move to make this a mandatory standard and they had to figure out how to make it important without basically angering too many of their customers. So they've made this extra credit, and I'm not even sure if that's official yet, or they're gonna look for some sort of certification system to make it happen. So, so this is where it's at. What I've put on top of the standard and the QR code is a link to an article I wrote that really, I think you might've all received it, that really digs into even deeper than this conversation into where I think the state of regulations are both locally and internationally and how we can really drive some of the movement, the meaning and the purpose into healthcare systems. Here is one of the agencies that I think is doing the most from a from a US federal standpoint to really think about sustainable healthcare. And this is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. This was again worked on by Hardeep Singh and Jody Sherman were two of the people who led the effort. And this is, it's not too long, I think it's about 30 pages that it was a publication that was put out by HRQ, reducing healthcare carbon emissions and essentially just a starting point for people. And what I've excerpted here, again, another busy slide, but it's their figure one and it's a summary of key measures and strategies for healthcare decarbonization. 
again, what's on here is paying attention to the energy that's done on site. So what's your grid like? Do you have any contracts to buy from renewable energy? Are you having large carbon sources? Can you reduce those? Anesthetic gases, transportation, pharmaceuticals are 20% of the healthcare sector emissions. They're huge. Are we wasting them? Can we help pharmaceutical companies um, apply more principles of green chemistry and the medical supplies and devices? And I, this was something that I had heard some memes saying just later, just at the end of the talk earlier, but there is starting to be some money here. And I want to show this to you because, again, money talks. Money is a lot of times the most important piece to bring to your sustainable healthcare administrators and your CEOs and your COOs when you're trying to make this argument. So AHRQ, this came out, I think, January of this year was when the official request for applications came. And this is uh, this is real funding. This is R01's big money associated with research on climate change and healthcare. I show you that they've got three categories, measuring and reducing carbon footprint, increasing resilience, and then addressing equity. Because of course, the people who have the fewest resources are the ones that are gonna be affected the most and the earliest in all of this. So we need to both learn from their, their experiences and help them not experience some of the harm. So those three categories are the main areas of research that they're looking for. And from my personal interest, I'm interested in measuring and reducing carbon footprint. And I'm actually working on the second bullet point here actively, which is what measures best capture healthcare organizations' carbon footprints in a way that can be standardized and comparable across different healthcare systems. It's a big bite that I took off. I, I knew that going into this, but it's it's bigger than I thought. So if anyone's interested in helping out, let me know. And then I want to I want to end with this calculation. I think I'll have a couple minutes left for questioning. So globally, we make about 37 billion metric tons of greenhouse gas. The U.S. makes 5.6 billion of those tons. The health health sector in the U.S. is 8.5 percent of U.S. greenhouse gases. Scope three emissions are 80 percent of U.S. healthcare sector. U.S. Scope three health sector emissions are 1% of global emissions. So the work that we're doing, sustainable healthcare, is responsible for one out of 100 steps that we need to take to eliminate carbon dioxide emissions. And what I think most importantly is it's being done in a country that has the resources to accomplish this goal. And it's being done in an institution that is mission, in institutions that are mission-based with a goal of improving patient health. So I really think there's a ton of potential to do good and to to make a lot of change in the world by sustainable healthcare. And again, I refer back, we're 1% of global healthcare emissions, but we're about 5% of global economy. So we can really make an outsized interest. And by driving these changes into the vendors and the sector that surrounds our health system, we can also we can also drive the changes into other parts of the economy that we won't necessarily expect. So that's that's my talk in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and happy to take any questions, thoughts that you all might have. Any questions? Well, certainly, question. you know, you the numbers are so daunting. It's, uh, you know, or sobering, maybe is the better word. Anyway, um, uh, it's clear that, it, you know, it's a two level um, approach. Uh, the lowest level is in eight. Kind of uh, uh, big based group. I mean, you know, you, you cited uh, some stats from three or four different either federal or other organizations and, you know, they're all out there, but gee, uh, we need to, uh, you need that oomph, you know, it's more than a, a one, two punch. It's who throws the first punch mm -hmm. um, with some power. That, that's mm -hmm. just my ramblings. I, I think you're entirely right. Like we, it's there's there's the grassroots, but the grassroots eventually has to catalyze regulatory change. And I encourage everyone, and I've done this myself, like reach into your network, see who's sitting in CMS, see who's in the Joint Commission, see who's at National Academy of Medicine, Department of Health, HHS. Like 
it's it's amazing, you know, the connections that once you dig into LinkedIn, you can start to figure out. And a lot of people in these organizations are very sympathetic to this cause. They don't just they just don't know exactly how to make their make their voice heard or make this a real opinion. But the more that they hear from people that they have some connection to, the more powerful this is. We are close to a tipping point here. John, did you have something? Oh, I was hoping he would elaborate on the uh, the system in England, NHS. Apparently, they're way ahead of us. They are. They are. Um, I, so Nick Watts has been the chief sustainability officer of NHS for a while at this point, which I think is just impressive. I mean, we don't have, I guess, John Balbic would be about the closest we have, but Nick Watts actually has real opportunity to go they also have they have goals that are stated i want to say it's 2043 that they're going to be net carbon net zero by 2043 i think it's somewhere in that maybe it's 2045 but nhs is ahead of us and and there's structural reasons for that too right it's a nationalized healthcare system their politics haven't politicized the environment in the same way in which we have and and they're very focused on delivering care almost uniformly. So a lot of the data we get on sustainable health care is actually coming out of NHS. And of course, it's sort of splintered. It's not just, you know, it's not the UK. You've got NHS Scotland and NHS England and Wales. So you've got all these little environments that can contribute to really digging up good ideas. But they, they are ahead of us um, and someone to look for, for example. This is amazing. I wish we had another 30 minutes to talk as always. Thank you so much, Dr. Meyer, for your wisdom and for sharing with us. Um, I wonder if you would you be willing to share your slides with us? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you would consider it, just send them to me and uh, we'll get them out to the group. I can think of about five that I'm already going to use in my presentations and the information that I'd love to share with my leadership.